How's the sound? Sounds all right from here. Okay. Um, so I'm starting with an idea called Protected Area Impact. And I'm putting this paper up because it's just about to come out. And uh, it, it talks, it defines a protected area impact. Impact is one of those terms that has about six different meanings, depending on where you come from. Uh, I mean it here in the sense of program evaluation, uh, which is very widespread in development aid, medicine, education, where people are working out how much difference they make with an intervention. It's starting to get some currency now in conservation, as it should. So protected area impact uh, in this context is how much difference we make by establishing our protected areas relative to the default of not having them there. Um, I'll also mention in passing that uh, this paper is part of a theme issue uh, of that journal that's, that's going online on Monday. So if you want to read current ideas about protected area impact, including marine parks, um, that's, that's a pretty good source acknowledging my bias. Um, one of the other lead authors uh, in this theme issue is Beth Fulton, um, who wrote a, a, a nice paper about modelling, and you heard her speak about that yesterday. And I'll refer to Beth's work a couple of times during this talk. Um, let me illustrate <clears throat> what I mean by impact, and I'm talking about biodiversity, but it could be livelihoods, it could be other things that we care about. Uh, the vertical axis, how much biodiversity we have left, we know it's been declining. Um, but we would like to think that through our interventions, we've mitigated that decline from the pink line to the green line. We'd like to tell ourselves that. Um, we also know that going into the future, it will continue to decline, no matter what we do. And we, again, we would like to think that we can mitigate that decline in the future through our interventions. <coughs> An important aspect of which is protected areas. So this is what we hope we've done. This is what we hope we'll do. The differences in both cases are impact, how much difference we make. I think this motivates all of us to, to get involved in conservation, making a difference. The trouble is that we very quickly lose sight of the end and we start focusing on the means and that's the source of a lot of confusion in terms of how we set our goals and how we measure progress, and that's what this talk is about. Um, <coughs> so are we dealing with belief systems or evidence base? And why have I got those particular slides over there on the, the right-hand side? Um, <coughs> I think, and this is demonstrable, that key aspects of policy practice management around protected areas, marine protected areas, including uh, inclusive, um, e either ignore evidence or ignore the opportunity to get the evidence that we need to show us how much difference we're making and to guide us in making as much difference as possible in the future. Um, so I think we've got a misplaced belief in the means and we've forgotten about the ends when we look at policy and practice. Um, and I'll go through five examples in the slides that follow to illustrate that point. On the way through, think about a few things. Think about why we expect higher standards in medicine and engineering. Why we expect uh, a rigorous evidence base uh, and rigorous testing. And yet, we don't expect and we don't get the same standards uh, in conservation. What's, what's at stake with medicine and engineering? People's lives, people's health. What's at stake if we mess up conservation? Species, it's pretty important. Um, and why is so much of the scientific planning of marine protected areas uh, not directed at impact, but at something else? So, five examples. The first one is we're very good at accumulating square kilometres of MPAs. Um, the trouble is, if we look at protected areas on land, they're mostly residual to extractive uses, they're pushed to the margins, they're in remote and unpromising areas. The same trend is now emerging in the ocean, and um, basically 
residual protected areas almost by definition have low impact. And that's what we find when people look at whole systems of protected areas, say in Costa Rica, which is, which is famous as a protected area system, the difference it makes is 7%, which means that 93% of the protected areas would be the same, at least in vegetation cover, if they were not protected. And that's a big number compared to most of the estimates that are out there. So the number, the extent, the percentage coverage of MPAs don't tell us anything about impact. That's a problem because we are preoccupied with square kilometres when we discuss MPAs. The Australian system of marine parks, which you can see there in different colours, is enormous. It was promoted as being very large. It's about a third of the Australian marine jurisdiction. What's the impact? Um, probably very little because we know that those parks were put there um, pretty well to, to allow business as usual. They were designed around oil and gas and for the most part around fishing. Um, <coughs> what we have as a global comp compass for protected areas is the Convention on Biodiversity Targets. Very few of them are quantitative. Qualitative ones are not very useful because you can always claim you've achieved them. Um, one of the unambiguously quantitative targets, number 11, calls for 10% coverage of the sea by 2020. Is that useful? Uh, I'd argue that it's not. Uh, it has nothing to do with impact, and there's a risk that in rushing to achieve 10% coverage, we will simply get the bits that are easiest to protect and not the bits that most need protection. There's a medical analogy, I suppose, which is let's go out there, set a target for 2020, we're going to increase the number of hospitals by a percentage. Uh, we're not going to worry about where they're located relative to need. Uh, and we're going to make some vague qualitative statements that aren't guidelines for anything about um, managing them well and spreading them e equitably. That's basically what we're doing with protected area targets. Um, second example. We've got massive MPAs being established in the open ocean. Some people think that's a sign of progress. As long as you re report on square kilometres and don't think about impact, that's probably true. Um, we need to ask whether they're really there to contribute to conservation or whether they're monuments for individuals, NGOs, governments. Um, if we look at inshore on the shelf uh, in Australia and internationally, we find that no-take MPAs very limited because they get in the way of things. Uh, the ones in the open ocean don't very much. Um, <coughs> there are lots of debates about inshore eminently threatened, offshore maybe threatened sometime in the future. Those are fairly unproductive as long as they're based on belief systems and not on evidence. It is possible for us to start to design balanced portfolios, inshore, offshore, based on need and based on clear goals, as long as you unpack assumptions and pull the evidence together. It's possible to do that. Uh, I haven't seen it done, but we could do it. Um, what are the medical analogies here? Um, build lots of hospitals. Don't worry too much about whether that, what they've got in them, just build the shells, um, stick them in the cheapest places you can, um, and then uh, avoid at all costs any sort of a strategic analysis about how they might be located um, to address need. That's effectively what we're doing with the big blue strategy. Management of MPAs. It's intuitively obvious that they need to be well managed. And lots of people put a lot of effort into managing them. Um, under the global leadership of the World Commission on Protected Areas, um, with a lot of investment, there is a great deal of activity in assessing management effectiveness. And there's a great deal of investment in managing marine parks, as there should be. The trouble is that we have no evidence to establish a link between management effectiveness 
and impact. I'm not saying there's no link, I'm just saying we're, the, the evidence base is lousy. There are three published studies that have investigated this and none of them have found a connection. Um, that might point to the need for more studies that do things differently, but at the moment there is no evidence base. So why are we managing? It's an unresolved question. Medical equivalents, again, measure inputs, outputs, funding staffing as inputs, number of patients treated in and out the door as outputs, occasionally measure how well they are when they leave, um, but don't investigate whether any of that has anything to do with overall health impact across a population or a jurisdiction. I'm putting up the medical analogies because mostly we would find them to be silly and unacceptable. And yet, um, we, we countenance similar approaches to marine parks. Um, there are lots of acronyms in planning marine parks, KBAs, Key Biodiversity Areas, EBSAs, uh, Environmentally or Biologically Significant Areas. Uh, then we've got principles, comprehensiveness, adequacy, representativeness. They've, they've been watered down considerably since they were first derived almost 20 years ago. Here, ecological features were a part of the Australian MPA designation. Lots of acronyms. Let's focus on KBAs because they're a way of establishing priorities for conservation. We have to see priorities as predictions. They're usually not stated very clearly, but if someone says these are priorities, they're making a prediction about the best way to use limited resources to achieve some objective, which may or may not be stated explicitly. Um, so our KBAs have a lot of momentum globally. Um, they, they've now got endorsement by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, they have a, a lot of funding behind them and a lot of influence. Are they the best way to set priorities globally in the oceans? We have no idea. We haven't matched them against others. How would we do that? Um, people mistake wide endorsement of these things through a campaign of getting people to endorse them as evidence base, but it's not. People mistake explicit criteria that make these things consistent as an evidence base, but it's not. That's simply a, that's a, a way of making a prediction. That's all criteria are. Um, if prior, uh, predictions are about priorities, if, if priorities are predictions, then we should test them. And I've said that to a few people, quite a few people, and I've had some people say, we can't do it. We don't know, we've just got to wait for 50 years and see if we got it right, which is a bizarre idea, totally mistaken. And this is where modelling like Beth's comes in, because the best handle we have on a prediction, the best way, way we have to test a prediction about a way of allocating marine parks to get future benefits is to do modelling. The kind of modelling that Beth was talking about which can deal with complex social ecological systems, but there are other approaches too, on land and in the sea. And some people then say, but that's just a model. Um, and my response would be that KBAs are a model, but they haven't been tested. And decision makers walk around every day with models in their heads, but those models are not taken out, laid on a table, scrutinized, subjected to sensitivity analysis, and then improved as a result. So we need explicit modelling, and that is our absolute best tool for saying, are KBAs better than any other way of setting priorities? What exactly are we trying to achieve? Under what circumstances which we will model? And what do we get out at the end relative to the counterfactual of doing nothing? How much impact would we have using KBAs versus some variation on them or versus a completely different approach and has not been done. So we have a globally endorsed approach to prioritisation with no evidence base. Equivalence in, in medicine, 
have a workshop, think about where to put new hospitals, get excited about it, get a lot of people to agree on criteria and sell that at a higher level, um, but do not test how well that approach would work in terms of health benefits uh, across a country or a state or globally. Um, systematic planning has, has got itself into some problems here as well with planning marine parks. Here's a picture um, published in PNAS a few years ago that uh, those red areas are priorities apparently to achieve 10% of the range of each of 129 species of marine mammals. Okay? What's wrong with that picture? Um, it caused a fair bit of disquiet in the marine mammal community and a bit of a debate in the journal, um, which wasn't really resolved all that effectively. Um, the obvious problems are that range maps don't tell us much about movements or about which places are important for different life history requirements at different times, but there's a whole lot of other problems. And it's not just this study, this is just an example. Um, there are lots of other broad-scale studies globally, the Coral Triangle, the Australian Marine Jurisdiction, that suffer from pretty serious flaws in terms of any sort of guidance for establishing marine parks. Um, so we, we've, we've stuck on representation. I, I argued, I've argued for 20 years that representation was important. Um, I'm arguing now in another piece of writing that it's a milestone that's become a millstone because we can't see past it as a, as a science community. Um, we've got a hammer, software to implement representation, so every problem looks like a nail, but a lot of problems are not. And so we've got an inappropriate tool. Um, extensive conservation plans, so-called, have serious problems with data because the data are always at a coarse resolution, always highly generalised. The proxies for biodiversity, for costs, for anything else that matters are so loose and so distant from what actually happens on the ground or in the water that we can't hope to identify priorities with any sort of accuracy. And we would be kidding ourselves if we believed that we could use coarse data to identify priorities and then use those as places to focus in in more detail. In other words, somehow there's a belief system, and this has been argued in the literature, that priorities must be nested. But if your first round of priorities are basically silly, that would be a pretty bad assumption. But it's a, an assumption that's made. Um, there are some other problems with representation, and um, if, if you'd like to read about those, they're, they're in that paper that I put up at the start of the talk. But basically, um, most representation studies have nothing to do with um, urgency, uh, and they don't tell us whether protected areas are the, the appropriate solution. Um, medical equivalent, use some software, allocate hospitals to the same number of hospitals to each state or province, or just simply assume that the, the, the density of sick people across a country or the globe is uniform and, um, and stick some hospitals down more or less evenly. Um, build them first where they're easiest to build. Don't worry about urgency and uh, don't check that hospitals are actually the solution to the health problems that we're facing. So last slide, um, where do we go? If all of that sounds dismal, there are ways through this. There are clear ways through. Um, but we, we need to think again. Uh, for me, this, this analogy is useful because I think if medical and engineering professionals operated the way some conservation professionals operate, they'd be in jail uh, for misconduct. And bad things would have happened to people. Bad things are happening through sloppy decision making now um, to species and populations, which is pretty serious as well. Um, it's possible right now to formulate policy targets at a global level uh, and operational objectives for planning and management that are directed at impact, which is the end of the means. We've got caught up in 
targets that address the means don't actually get us to the end. We can do that now, and we've, we've laid out some examples in that paper. Um, <coughs> we have the modelling capability, and, and Beth, Beth's work is an illustration, um, to support the formulation of policy targets and operational objectives and to say, how can we make a difference in the future, um, 20 years ahead, for example? What are the best ways of making a, dif uh, a difference in the future? How much do they cost? How do we implement those politically? We have the modelling tools to do that. So we can start to set objectives and move towards them for impact, not for the means. Um, we are pretty close to having planning tools at the operational level that will help us to achieve impact at fine scales. Um, we can use impact thinking to inform our decisions about improving data, because data always need improving, but you have to be strategic about which data and where. Um, the only thing that's lacking is the will. The, that's the only impediment to moving forward, uh, apart from the inertia of the, the approaches that we have at the moment that need to be overhauled. Thank you.